Thank you. A very warm good afternoon to all of you. I know that the plenary session ran a little late, and so uh, there'll be people filtering in. First of all, a uh, warm welcome. And this is the arena. I love the arena. Don't you like the <laughs> arena? Yes. Now, the idea of the arena in the old days is you're supposed to let people fight amongst each other. But we are a very friendly arena. But the topic in itself is so critical. Um, I really like this topic, and I was really glad that the forum says, can you please moderate it? My name is Annie Ko. I'm from Singapore Management University. And a lot of people in this room will probably say, what does a Singaporean know about disruptive times? <laughs> <laughs> we do have some disruption, all right, train disruptions. But we do, and we do understand that the region is, it has huge potential. I think throughout the whole one day, two days that you've been here, a lot of you would have heard about the 600 million population, the wonderful 10 countries, and how they've all been trying to work towards integration. But before we get to what it means uh, to be a leader driving growth in this region, I really like the idea that I have such a diverse panel in the arena. And I think to be said, congratulations to the forum for giving me my wish list. I've asked the forum that in the panel discussions that I run, there must be sufficient number of women. Do you agree that this is a wonderful <laughs> diversity? Can we clap to that? <laughs> we thank you so much for that. And what in the world are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk about leadership. And I think a resilient leader goes a long way. But it's not enough because a resilient leader who builds the system and the culture for building a resilient organization to prepare for decision making is very critical. So this is our first conversation on leadership and we have a wonderful arena of great leaders. And in uh, all you know, honesty, I cannot read their CVs. You have copies of it. And so I'm just going to introduce them by title and I'm going to make them jump in after I've introduced them to quickly set the tone. What exactly does this topic about resilient leadership mean to them? And what has it got to do with the disruptions that they are seeing around them? So on my right, I'm very privileged to have Mr. Manuel Aranita Rojas. And from now on, I'll call him Ma. Yes, please. Wonderful. <laughs> That's his nickname. Okay, and he's the Secretary of the Interior and Local Government of the Philippines. And so that's our host, and I'm sure they have a lot to share with us <laughs> about leadership in disruptive times. Next to him, our wonderful friend, my friend, Melody Meyer. She's the president of Chevron Asia Pacific Exploration and Production Company, Chevron Corporation, based in Singapore now. But if you read her profile, she's been to all the dangerous countries of the world. <laughs> so we definitely will hear from her very shortly. And then opposite me, we have Alain Ashleman, and that's the last time I'm going to pronounce your last name, okay? And Alain is the head of operations in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific for the International Committee of the Red Cross, Geneva. And of course, the Red Cross is very inclusive, and they looked after the less privileged, and they are definitely multi-stakeholders' perspective. So leadership within the Red Cross, leadership in the countries that the Red Cross have presence. And next to Alan is our wonderful friend. We have Kyung Hwa Kang. And Kyung Hwa is the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator. What a mouthful, Kyung Hwa. <laughs> yeah. But the nice part is you deal with emergency and you relieve the emergency. Yes. We hope so. And with the United Nations. So Kyung Hwa again comes from a very broad perspective. And of course, I thought it would be nice to finish the final voice on this arena with Jeff Riddle. And Jeff holds the title of being a member of the Global Executive Committee and Regional Chairman of Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa for Zurich Insurance Group, based in Hong Kong. <laughs> Not much disruption there, no. like Singapore, but completely understanding that the environment <clears throat> is changing. So can we quickly jump in? Ma, can we start with you? When you're invited to this little conversation, 
What are the big thoughts that hit you about this topic? Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to, to all of you to my country. Over the last two generations, disruptiveness was a constant description of my country. We were referred to nicely by economists as event rich or full of exogenous events. But really what they were referring to, what they were referring to were man-made calamities of a political sort. Martial law, uh, riots, political clashes, uh, disruptions in business, uh, sudden reversals in policy, and so on and so forth. And all of these exogenous events collectively made us, the, made us to be described as the sick man of Asia. Uh, while all of our neighbors were galloping off at 7, 8, 9% growth in the 80s and 90s, we were muddling along at a much lesser rate, 4 or 5%, if, if that. More recently, over the last four years, we have had a series of natural calamities. Uh, we had in, in 2010 or 2011 the, uh, the huge uh, typhoon uh, that was called Habagat. I, I will use all our local names, so mm -hmm. Habagat, and then followed by Sendong, followed by Pablo, followed by Yolanda recently. And, and, and just to put a per, make it a little bit more personal, I recall shortly after one Christmas, uh, the president and I were having a quiet chat, and, and he was saying, my God, you know, it's been three Christmases already, and each Christmas, thousands have died. You know, and, and what are we in government for uh, but, but to try and address this, this sort of uh, uncertainty in people's lives? And that, in a very real way, is what the natural calamities as a disruptive event is to us you know, in, in, in government under President Aquino. But notwithstanding these events, and other calamities. The president mentioned it upstairs, the earthquake, the Sambuanga, and so on and so forth. Right? We've been able to overcome this. And not only have we been able to overcome this over the last four years, we've been able to help four and a half million families daily uh, by giving them part this CCT, conditional cash transfer. We've been able to insure millions of families with uh, health insurance. Mm -hmm. We've been able to provide growth, opportunity, stability, such that it might be meaningless to the average Filipino, but in the international community, we have now attained investment grade from what was a junk bond status. We have interest rates now that are at 2 3% versus historically 9 10%. Imagine your business is having to have that interest rate burden of 9 10% for decades. Um, we are, uh, in short, cash positive, and, and in fact, uh, are, able, are able to make our way both from a foreign exchange point of view as well as from a budget deficit point of view. And, I, and I, I consider this development, this positive development, as the product of another kind of disruption. Mm -hmm. This disruption happened in 2010 when we as a people elected an honest man as president. And with that, with that leadership, with his what we call the Ang Matuid or straight road uh, program, his entire team, his entire government, uh, and the Filipino people all together were able to righten our ship, point us in the positive direction. Uh, we were able to break this mold of doing things just the way they were in the past. We were, we, we were able to destroy this notion of go along to get along, of business as usual. And to use the president's phraseology, we were able to reject this kick the can down the road mentality, which is, well, if I, if I solve just a little bit of it, it won't be my problem, it'll be my successor's problem. Right? And, and it, these, these have enabled us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, so, so we are where we are, and maybe this is one, one of the accoutrements of success we're able to host the World Economic Forum here now in May of 2014, four years after the president uh, was elected. I think the key element here is that the resource was always there, and that was the Filipino people, mm. except that they were shackled and burdened by a corrupt government, corrupt leaders, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I say this also to include myself, an elite that was perhaps more interested in protecting their own interests as opposed to the broader interest. 
Um, and now we have a situation where there is this virtuous cycle, and, and uh, hopefully that can continue into the future. So disruptiveness, you know, I, I remember at the turn of the century in, in 2000, this was an often made prediction of change at an accelerated pace would be the feature of the coming mm -hmm. millennium. And, and uh, I, I then paraphrase by saying, be careful what you predict, you might just get it. <laughs> and, and that's what we have. And um, perhaps I can leave for later on discussion some other elements of, of, of why we've, I think we've been able to overcome this. But I just wanted to put in perspective what this disruptiveness notion is in real terms from, from a people who, has, who, who have struggled for generations and now finds their rightful place uh, in, uh, in the world. Very good. Thank you. So actually, we are very encouraged because the words I'm hearing from here is values-based leadership and that, in fact, you can build resilience but with the right leadership. I'm going to turn to you, Melody. Um, okay. Exploration for oil, integrated energy company, and you've been places in the world like Tengiz, Kazakhstan, Papua New Guinea. You really love adventure, don't you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Tell us your piece. Well, we work in many wonderful countries of the world, including the Philippines and throughout Asia Pacific and some areas that are prone to natural, natural disasters. But as far as our decision making, I want to talk a little bit about the way that we manage risk and, and um, make decisions in, in the face of a lot of uncertainty and risk and also how we're prepared to not only uh, manage but respond and have very good business continuity in a, in a disruptive world. So just to you know, kind of frame our, our um, of course, we know energy underpins economic growth, and it enables a transition of millions of people into the middle class. And um, by 2030, Asia is going to be the largest consumer of crude oil and natural gas in the world, uh, driven by this growing middle class. So we know how important energy is to the region. There's a strong common interest in promoting general energy security across the region. And we think by, by having good energy security in the region, it does actually um, promote um, um, less disruption. I mean, there'll be less disruption with more energy security. So the, the world um, is fortunate that this region, or the, the, we're all fortunate that this region of the world is, uh, has abundant supplies of natural resources, oil, um, natural gas, geothermal, renewables, coal, and all of those will support the growth in this region, which is really good. We think all forms of energy are needed, particularly natural gas, and natural gas obviously goes into um, generating power and reliable power is very, very important for communities to have uh, little disruption, basically. So um, Chevron has experienced this firsthand. We're the largest domestic producer of natural gas in Thailand and Bangladesh. And we know that we keep the lights on and we keep business open for business. And when there's a disruption in that, of course, it's, um, it's a challenge for the communities. So having reliable, secure supply of energy resources will really play an important part so you feel in stability of, of the region. The right. sense of responsibility right. for the but to, but to achieve that long-term investment, we have some very specific uh, processes that we use in our company to um, assess risk and manage risk. So they're, they're processes that we put in place many years ago to look at um, just a, a, a range of um, you know, issues such as stakeholder management, um, technical risk, subsurface risk, cost and schedule delay, um, and all of these, all of our energy developments and our reliable energy are in areas that are prone to natural disaster. So in addition to operating in those environments, we um, use a lot of tools around emergency management, emergency response, many, many of the tools that countries use to, to um, harden their facilities and um, be prepared for emergency response and dis disasters. So the key to emergency response is always first prevention. Mm -hmm. So we focus heavily on prevention with our processes and then it's to be prepared um, to respond and to focus heavily on business continuity. Now business continuity for us means not only responding to the emergency ourselves because we live and work in the communities in which we operate. So we have to get our own families and our employees and our business partners um, you know, after an earthquake or after a hurricane, after a typhoon or after a natural disaster, we have to get our employees um, able to respond to 
um, their families' lives, but then we have a high accountability and responsibility to get energy supplies back on mm -hmm. because we know that the energy supplies is what helps the rest of the communities rebuild. So we have kind of a two-pronged effort, and to be in a position to do that, it's a lot of emergency response planning. We do a lot of drills, a lot of processes, um, a lot of systems in place so that we're very, very well prepared to do that. So, you know, we have the, the you know, one side being a producer of oil and gas <coughs> and, and actually keeping economies and communities running is an important um, role that we play not to have any disruption that would cause a disruption there. But then we also have the, the disruptions to our business that we manage um, through very, very um, detailed processes that we've used for many, many years. Good. Just to push you a little bit, then we go on to Alan. How many people are there involved in this whole Chevron exercise that you have to look after? Well, in, in uh, the Asia Pacific region and my region, I, there are 12,000 employees across our, nice. our countries, and all are very, very well trained in um, safety, um, responding to emergencies, drills, and preparedness. Good. And, and they take, you know, just one other comment about that is that our employees that, that train a lot in those processes that, you know, business hardening, resiliency, <laughs> safety, they take that home. So we take it home to our families and to the communities in which we work and, and live. So we'll talk about how you prepare 12,000 people later. Okay. Think about that. Alan. Thank you very much for the invitation. And also thank you very much for the Philippine hospitality. Really mm -hmm. enjoy a lot. Uh, I mean, for, for, for me and, and my organization, it's clear that instability and uh, problems are, I would say, our, our, daily, our daily work. And uh, with our specificity to, uh, to work as an emergency actor, mainly in conflict uh, scenarios, and ability to uh, rapid deployment, uh, we, we are facing now a lot of, of challenges. And uh, I think that the, the world today is really marked by imprevisibility. I think that uh, one year ago, nobody uh, could uh, anticipate what is happening in uh, Ukraine. I mean, the situation in Middle East, uh, also in Sahel. And so we have really to, to adapt to this uh, new world, and I would say to have a, a huge faculty of, um, of uh, creativity and also of uh, reactiveness. Mm -hmm. In parallel, we have also a, a duty and a, a commitment to support and strength, uh, strengthen the capacities of uh, national societies of the Red Cross and Red Cross to act uh, and also to work with a, with a federation. Uh, and this means that uh, the Red Cross movement is uh, working throughout the spectrum of crisis, this option from man-made disaster to, uh, to, to natural disaster, uh, combining local and uh, international uh, response uh, and offering a la large spectrum of uh, of services and expertise. Might be some words about disruptions because mm -hmm. it's clear that uh, I mean uh, Asia is a, is a region of uh, impressive growth, a lot of su uh, successes in, in many respects, and at the same time it's a very di diversified region. And uh, we spoke a lot, and we will continue to speak about natural disasters. But it's clear that. We have much, uh, much. Uh, it's much broader. We we have a lot of uh, traditional and non-traditional security issues, armed conflict and uh, and violence in several countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we have fragility, tension related to uh, political, religious, and ethnic dimension, territorial and maritime dispute, ter ter terrorist acts, uh, uh, etc. Uh, I would like maybe to 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 mention or stress uh, two two issues which are of concern. It is. The strong and in some parts, in some countries, increased nationalism mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, increased inequalities. Uh, and this, I think, uh, might be issues uh, to, to, to discuss a bit later. And uh, a word also about uh, the fact that most dis disruptions as such are not unexpected. Uh, the problem is mainly with the low likelihood of some of them and the high impact phenomena. Um, what is Give ex us an example. What do you mean by high impact but low probability? Just one of the uh, examples. If you take, for example, armed conflict between uh, at the time between Cambodia and, and Thailand, mm. I think we did not expect this. It was mm. a low uh, probability, but it happened. Yeah. 
uh, when you have uh, Ayan, uh, I mean Yolanda, uh, the uh, ma magnitude of this typhoon, I don't think that anybody expected it. Mm. So it's this element, but we knew that it was coming. And, uh, and yet you knew it was coming and we could not have preventive measures? I mean, a lot of preventive measures uh, were, were taken, but it was definitely not, not enough. enough. Also, uh, in relation to the uh, to the magnitude of the of the of the typhoon. Yeah. And how do you prepare leadership for that? It's preparedness uh, at uh, also at uh, at community level with uh, with the national societies, with the volunteers. I mean, there are uh, worldwide uh, thirty million. Uh, active uh, volunteers. So we have 12,000 in Chevron and you have 30 million. Volunteers of the record recursion. In my organization, we are uh, 14,000. Right. So good. So 30 million at a voluntary level. Yes, Very good. and the so national societies yes. uh, in the, the country. So my follow-up question later will be about how do you prepare the organization and the community. Kiongwa. Thank you very much, Annie. Just to build up one, Alex, that we both belong to the larger humanitarian community, but my organization is the coordinator, the small linchpin that holds together humanitarian action when these uh, huge disruptions have. And, and we're talking about really big, big disruptions that are, that are, that, that are disasters, uh, that are conflict-related mass displacement. And so it's basically our business. Our business is to respond to huge crises that are the result of Give natural us, disasters or conflict-related disasters. Yeah? Give us an example of this small linchpin. Um, coordination means bringing together all humanitarian actors uh, so that our actions are well-coordinated and there is no gaps left and there is a minimum repetition. Um, Everybody knows that this coordination is absolutely necessary, but the willingness to be coordinated uh, is, is not always there. So it's, it's a difficult job, but it, you know, it's the, the UN General Assembly uh, in 1991 said, this is absolutely necessary uh, mm -hmm. for the humanitarian community to be effective. So they created this uh, office that is now a part of the UN Secretariat but works with the larger humanitarian community, which involves the UN agencies, but also the ICRC, IFRC, and, and the National uh, Humanitarian Act, I mean, the uh, civil society, NGO humanitarian actors. Mm -hmm. Because the nature of our work is basically responding to these huge crises, uh, the idea of uh, resilience building uh, sometimes doesn't immediately register our risk analysis and risk management. But even the humanitarian community now see that this is absolutely necessary because as we all predict, these huge mega weather events that lead to crisis will, will repeat themselves. Okay. Uh, it's not if, it's when. Uh, and this area is particularly prone to these mega disasters. And the humanitarians simply do not have the ability to deal, respond. Uh, uh, with the traditional ways of doing things, with just the traditional actors doing things. So very happy to come to WEF and see that there is a great deal of willingness and readiness and already good practices of private sector actors getting in on the humanitarian um, uh, side of things. So I think you know, the, this multi-sectoral partnership to prepare for and also to respond to crisis is, is really the future. Uh, and I think that's the humanitarian discourse is really heading in that direction. But what does that mean for the organization is perhaps something that we want to get into now or I can, I, that's a real, you know, a thought piece that triggers a lot of uh, issues in my mind. Very good. We'll come to back to that. Jeff, you understand risks, right? They all tell you that mm. there are plenty of risks. You actually would say Zurich Insurance would be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Annie. Uh, um, you know, we've talked about micro and macro. Um, I think we've also got to talk to, about internal and external. So we take on other people's risks, but at the same time, we have to make sure we're resilient ourselves and able to deal with the commitments that we've made to the people we take those contracts from. 
that's a process that's become much more sophisticated and uh, has been enhanced continually over the years. So we now talk about risk-based capital, we talk about modeling, we work with regulators to go through stress tests, we do scenario planning, stuff that many insurers were doing themselves but is now being pushed on us on a consistent basis worldwide. At the same time, we're looking at how we deal with other people's disruptions. Now, that can be a simple issue of somebody's house burning down and what do we do to help them individually in that situation, providing accommodation for them, helping them buy, um, do the repairs to the house, helping them buy the products that they need to refill what they've lost. Or it can be a much more macro issue of dealing with a major weather crisis, as we've talked about. But uh, you know, these crises come in, these disruptions come from many places. Uh, nobody's talked about cyber risk at the moment. Nobody's talked about how we build bigger interdependencies on ourselves as we build smart grids. Mm. We saw the major power outages that we had in Italy and the US a few years ago. The smart grids are trying to deal with those, but at the same time, they, they can smooth out. But if they collapse, it's far worse than what we had before. So as societies got cleverer, it uh, does create potential disruption which is much larger than we had in the past. Um, I could go through pandemics and uh, how travel has changed the whole planning for those. What I really want to <coughs> get to is that the disruptive effects of uh, all sorts are much greater than they've been. We have to prepare by going through scenario planning. We have to go through and learn from every event that happens. And we have to try and share that around our customer base, other insurers working with government. So we're in a fast evolving world of understanding our interdependencies better. And we're also becoming more dependent on all those players sharing with each other. I could go on and on, but okay. that's the... Uh... So I've not actually <clears throat> bounced this off with all of you before this conversation, but it suddenly occurred to me. Why don't we take a fictitious case? Why don't we take a case study since I'm a professor? So let's bounce <laughs> off this case study. Hypothetical, we are all worried about Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. And that's like low probability, but it could have great impact. We are all very connected here in ASEAN. Travel and tourism is a big thing. Everybody travels to it. So from a national point of view, if there is a case <laughs> of MERS in Philippines, what would be the response? Ma? Well, it's funny that you mentioned MERS uh, because uh, over the last maybe month or two months ago, uh, we found ourselves in the middle of the night going to the Department of Health, trying to track down these passengers that have come in uh, who were tested in the Middle East as positive, but once having arrived here, were finally tracked down, but then tested negative, knock on wood. No? <laughs> uh, uh, from a Philippines point of view, this is a real risk. Uh, we have two million expatriate Filipinos servicing the needs of the Middle East. Um, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, etc. Et we have 10 wide body jumbos coming in every day, mostly filled with vacationing or returning uh, Filipinos from the area. Um, and and uh, once they arrive, then they go to our 7,000 islands, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's quite difficult to find them. Um, so it's, for us, it's a real risk. Um, we, uh, as you know, this MERS uh, covirus is a phenomenon over the last three or four years only, not much is known. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the symptoms, is, is also not quite, you could be asymptomatic and yet be uh, contagious, I mean, mm. you, you can contaminate people. Right. Um, so, so far, uh, our preparations have been, one, to try and ensure that whatever is the 
reason for coming home, to include I'm not feeling well, that the Philippine consulates uh, in the area of origin are sort of more alert so that they prevent the person from boarding. Mm -hmm. uh, second, better coordination so that what they know at point of origin, we sort of can still um, catch them in this, in this sieve or in this trough as they come out of the airport. Um, and then third, uh, which is more long term, uh, to make sure that each person, as they leave, uh, this is through the office of uh, overseas Filipinos, mm. um, that there is somebody responsible that we can have contact numbers and, and addresses for the families here. Uh, aside from that, it's really just strengthening the general capacity of our healthcare system to be able to, uh, to address uh, the event if, in fact, it, it does happen. But uh, so far, uh, I find it uncomfortable that I keep saying knock on wood, but <laughs> basically, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a lot of that, uh, that, that we haven't had a positive case uh, as yet. Good. And you, although your title says you looked after the interior, you've just mentioned four to five different agencies and ministries. Right? The, the interior is pretty, mu is pretty much all-encompassing <laughs> from the police to fire. Uh, and, and I also have the infrastructure that goes to the village level. Mm. So if the Department of Health is looking for somebody, I would be the natural sort of infrastructure to go and find them. Or, or if uh, people are hard-headed and don't want to be confined, then it would be my infrastructure or my department's infrastructure that would sort of forcibly uh, extricate them from the community and bring them to isolation areas if necessary. Good. Our whole melody first on this one. How would the humanitarian and the Red Cross respond? Well, I think the health uh, risks, um, health disaster risks, um, is, is, is an area that's uh, very much uh, planned for uh, with the WHO in the lead. We just have this recent announcement from the WHO putting travel restrictions on these countries where the polio outbreak has been a serious um, challenge, mm -hmm. uh, such as Pakistan. And once uh, that is declared, there is then a, you know, a, 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 a intense discussion between the WHO and the, the national authorities to how to implement that travel restriction. So I think health uh, disease, these uh, uh, are, 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 the protocols are there. And, mm. and the, MERS, the newness of the, it, the disease is always a challenge. Uh, but I think in terms of the steps to take to contain that is something that is uh, quite well elaborated. Um, what but, are, then what would be the worst case disruptions that you really wouldn't like to look at? Well, I think, you know, this mega natural disaster such as Yolanda has been a huge challenge, an overwhelming challenge, both to the national authorities as well as the international actors. But we always talked about Philippines as being one of the best prepared countries in the world when it came to natural disasters because there's so much of it. The and, practice. And, 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 yeah. and, yes, we so have, a practice. We have about and, 20 to 25 such typhoons, and not of your land magnitude. You, and you, ha you yeah. have a system of preparedness that is very well elaborated and very well synchronized with the international architecture so that it is very easy for the international yeah. players to come in and plug in to the national system <coughs> in support of the national authorities. And this was exactly what happened in Yolanda. Mm -hmm. And there are, I think Yolanda's experience has, will be talked about for many years to come, both here in this region and for us because there are many good lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, act, you know, that steps that need to be, to be uh, revised and improved. But overall, the stories are so rich coming out of Yolanda. Mm -hmm. um, but you ask about what does it mean to be that linchpin? If I, can I give you an exact Sure, an I was hoping example? for that. Yeah. Um, for example, I was in the DRC, uh, the Congo, in the eastern region where these armed uh, elements, insurgencies, continued to happen. Last year, the story was the M23. They have given up their arms and now being in in reintegrated into the government forces. But there was a time when the M23 has again attacked this town called Goma and uh, you know, triggered thousands of new displacements. And these displaced people were spontaneously gathering in this empty public slot. And so you know, a transit site had to be quickly put together, you know, literally overnight. 
And I just happened to be there when this was happening. And this in this small area that doesn't look like any larger than a schoolyard. Thousands of people just mingling. And on appearance, it looks absolutely chaotic. But if you look at closer, there are humanitarian actors, ICRC, MSF, UN, all, organ all doing their things. And this young coordinator, an OCHA staff, was there with three phones <laughs> in her hands, answering calls, you know, calling the local authorities, and also calling the M23 commanders. Mm. Uh, because it is the, the, the humanitarian actors need that access to both state and non-state actors to be, able to, to be able to bring assistance to populations, whether they're under government control or you know, non-state uh, armed actors control. So the coordination was in the hands of this young lady holding three, three cell phones mm. um, to bring about some sense of order and to make sure that what was needed, you know, the toilets being set up, uh, medical uh, clinics being set up, and so on and so forth. Uh, at some point, she got a phone call in, in very fast French that I could understand. So I asked, what was that about? And she said, well, somebody called because she's, you know, this, they need a jackhammer to put up the tents. Mm. So it can get as ad hoc and, and real as that. Uh, but this is, this is emergency humanitarian response, as, as real as it gets. Very good. And how do you get them trained? How does this young lady know how to coordinate? No, we have a series of training programs to make people, you know, to prepare people for this kind of thing. But that's the work. But the, your other question, how do you keep the resilience of the organization to be able to do these kinds of things? It's a real challenge because, you know, donors don't think of humanitarian organizations uh, anything beyond the emergency response. So it's very difficult to get the funding support to do organizational building that needs to be done to have staff prepare for these kinds of things. So that's a constant challenge. Uh, but it's, it's you, know, you know, to make sure that your staff are not burned out, to make sure that take the rest that they need, they make sure that they get the training that they need, and to get funding support for that is, is, is an everyday challenge. Right. Good. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to talk about the, co the, the coordinator. Mm. In Yolanda, because I was at Ground Zero the, day, the evening before Yolanda arrived. Mm. Uh, the Secretary of National Defense and myself, we went ahead to, to sort of <laughs> make sure that all that could be done uh, would, would in fact be done. But I, I recall that the coordinator, the UN coordinator, Ocha, mm -hmm. was very, very helpful working with our social welfare department, working with us, the police, working with the National Defense for the Armed Forces, with the trucks to bring in the food and so on. They played a key role mm. in ensuring that every organization, every acronym, I mean every let, multi-lettered acronym <laughs> organization in the world would have some place where they could have some information and get some coordination as mm. to what areas were still unserved and what else they could do and, and so on and so forth. So, so that's a clear example from, from the Yolanda. Very situation. good. And I guess when you're in a disaster, you know, everybody wanted to help. Yes. But sometimes mm -hmm. there's too much help, mm -hmm. and you need to bring that yeah. in order. Mm -hmm. I'd I like to open up to the floor. I know that you can't wait to jump in on MERS. You want to say something about MERS, Jen? No. Nope. Okay. Can we open up to the, the floor? Because we only have about 20 minutes, yeah. and I know that there's a burning issue here. Do you have questions from the floor? If the mic is going around. Oh, you, yes. Please introduce yourself. And Thank you, Annie. Uh, my name's Andrew Thomas. I'm with Ogilvy & Mather. So we work with a lot of, a lot of companies um, uh, in crisis often. Um, for for the, the panel that are here, um, the, uh, the advent of social media has arguably removed the option for leaders not to communicate in a crisis. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about resilience of leadership, how do you find that leaders in today's world are actually stepping up to the challenge uh, of really being resilient in their communication? Um, and as an organization, actually being accommodating of uh, the, the, the challenge that that leader may be going through uh, and not looking for a, for a scapegoat at that time. Melody, do you want to respond to that? Sure. No, I, you know, with today's social media, um, any incident in the world is in the news instantly, and we all know that. And I think being prepared for that is also as important as being prepared for the incident. And 
So um, part of, you know, I talked about a very uh, strong systematic process that we use in our company to prepare for uh, one, prevent, and then prepare for emergency response. Uh, part of that is communications. And mm -hmm. we, we, not only do we drill um, uh, crisis management, we, we drill on pandemics. I mean, mm -hmm. using your example yes. of a pandemic, um, just to share what we would do is we have health professionals all over the world. And as we see um, a, a pandemic potential, we'll start escalating that. We'll start communicating with all of our employees. We'll, um, we'll raise the threat levels if it comes up. We'll start um, talking about it in serious. We, we know how to quarantine. We know where people are. But we also know how to, um, we drill the communication. So as we drill on crisis communication, we also talk about um, you know, the, how quickly we can get information, how quickly we get it out into the news, and, you know, what kind of either media that we use, whether it's social media or if it's spoken media in a country, always in, in the uh, country language is important. Simple, um, some of our incidents or some of our um, operations are technical and it's important to not be technical, it's important to be very very clear about the communication. So we, we practice that just mm -hmm. as we practice emergency response and I think it's important to do that because um, news travels so quickly these days and it's important to communicate. Right. Would you do the same thing? Yeah, Jack? I think uh, there's something that's not been talked about which is if you want to be resilient you have to look at the, the players. So you can't put non-resilient people in jobs when they're going to be under pressure. You've got to look at the resiliency of your partners and who you work with. <laughs> so resilience comes from an assembly of a lot of pieces. Um, you talked uh, about the communication over there. One of the things that we know is you've got to hold people back from trying to say things when they desperately want to. That's part of the practice you're talking about, Melody, but it's also um, making sure they don't uh, create additional problems, that they don't talk ahead of what they know, mm. that they don't exhaust themselves by focusing on uh, communication when they also need to balance with other decisions mm -hmm. that need to be made. So balance is always a critical part. Understanding in advance who all the critical players are and understanding their resilience in advance is very important. And we spend a lot of time choosing the members of our crisis committees and making sure that the balance of the behaviors in those are going to work properly. So it's not just a go through, uh, we need these functions there. You've got to look at the mix of people going into those crisis committees. How do you do resilient training? <clears throat> Well, you do, uh, uh, and I think uh, that's the easiest question you've asked. The only mm -hmm. way you do it is by going through scenarios and practicing it. But those are textbook <coughs> scenarios. No, I don't. Uh, I mean, that's... Is that good enough? I'm yeah, just but, asking uh, the... But you, you don't do a set textbook scenario. You bring changes into it. You disrupt people. Mm -hmm. throughout. If you don't disrupt the way people are working through uh, a... a, a scenario planning exercise, uh, through a, a, a work through exercise, they're not going to learn anything from it at all. Mm. It, it's got to be disruptive. Is that enough, Alain? I, you know, I started in this uh, activity 27 years ago. So at that time, I would say we were learning by doing. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that there is a lot of progress. And now we have uh, courses on stress uh, and security, for example, stresses on leadership management. Uh, and then uh, you, 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 you... Throw them. Yes, you throw them and also you, you see how they react. For example, if I take Ayan, and it was the same with, uh, with Pablo uh, one year before. It happens in November or December and then you have a rainy season. And I mean the people had to work in incredible difficult situations. For example, in a, uh, for, for Pablo, our people for one month uh, were sleeping in tents and, and working in, in tents. And uh, at the same time, and to come back to the, to the question about social media, you have, uh, yes, I mean, beneficiaries, they look at what you are doing. It's not only the good you, you do, but also mm -hmm. the good you look at. And this is a, an additional pressure, and I think it's, uh, it's good as such. And so we developed also beneficiary communication. For example, mm -hmm. uh, recently we, we, we distributed cash in, uh, 
in, in, in uh, ion affected areas, and we uh, opened a, a hotline that beneficiaries can also uh, comment, I mean, if there was something not mm -hmm. uh, going well. And like this, we can also react very quickly in case there are any, any issues. But I think it's, we are in a, in, a, in a changing world and also uh, working practice are changing, but uh, training and support you can give to your staff uh, are really key elements. Good. I think this Go point on. about communication is very important. I think, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, absolutely factual. Uh, without exaggeration, but without under, you know, um, uh, understating the challenge uh, and uh, setting the narrative early uh, after disaster happens is, is very important and this is a key part of our work as the information management uh, entity along with our, the coordination role. But for staff, um, you, you know, it's staff stress counselors mm -hmm. are, are a, a, a very important part of our organization. Yep. And it's not just the stress that comes with this very, very uh, demanding job, but humanitarian workers in, in a very difficult situations are sometimes targeted um, mm -hmm. and become collateral damage in violent situations. So they themselves go through these dish. traumatic experiences. And how do you then help them to recover from that and, and, and get back to normal? It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And uh, I don't think we have it. I don't think you could ever perfect that kind of a challenge, uh, the responses. But uh, we're, we're, we've made huge progress. Good. Just, just, yes. Could you have a mic here? Hi. My name is Kay Kim. I'm a global shaper from the Seoul Hub. Uh, since we're at the World Economic Forum, I'd like to raise the question around international coordination in terms of disaster and risk situations. Like, are there given protocols or like a threshold for the international community to step into a local problem? I guess it's a lot well thought through in terms of developing nations where lots of disasters happen. When it comes to developed nations, I guess it's lesser thought through. Like, for instance, in the case of Japan, and also, like recently in Korea, there was a big ferry accident where 300 people died. And there was problems around, like, the manuals were not there, mm. we're not really well prepared. Mm. So how does the international community think about these disasters happening all over the world? Mm. When to step in and how? Mm -hmm. Great question. It was supposed to be my last question. Mm -hmm. So you asked it for me. Thank you. Well, the basic principle of international humanitarian assistance is uh, at the request of the national authorities. Um, and so if the national authorities, the capacity inside the country is sufficient and it works and there is no need, there is no need for us to go in. But if that's not enough and the national authorities call for international assistance, we go in. Uh, and in the case of Yolanda, the, re the request was really immediate, immediate. And, and rightly so, because I think the enormity of the challenge was just uh, overwhelming for, for all of us. So it is really at the request of the national authorities. Um, so a lot of these disasters, we don't go in, uh, because it, the local actors, the government plus the local gov authorities and the, and the uh, national chapters of uh, Red Crest and Red Crescent societies uh, do excellent work. Um, but you're really talking about really big crisis situations when the international uh, community uh, represented by the UN humanitarian agencies go in. Um, and, but once we go in, there is a series of protocols that all of us adhere to to maximize what we're able to bring to the ground. And I think that was the case in Yolanda, but every crisis has it's lessons a, learned, and we are learning a lot from the Yolanda response. A short yes, he would like an, a mic, a short follow up. Thank you. So I guess when it happens, like that's the protocol, but like what before, like what can we do to prevent it? For instance, a country can think that they're prepared and they have all the manuals ready, but sometimes that's not the case. Then. Can the international community kind of you know, help monitor their manuals, help man, uh, you know, manage the protocols and monitor them so that they you know, give them advice about, you know, are you guys ready fully? Are you sure? Like, can we help? Mm. Is there some kind of a method to do that as well? Yeah, I think reinforcing that same question. Yeah, please use the mic. You know, because... Uh, uh, you are? Yeah, yes. Uh, my name is Kumar, K.S. Kumar. Okay. 
Right. I'm just thinking about the same thing that you know uh, young men was talking about. How do you institutionalize and how do you bring in uh, the best practice? How do you create some kind of a form and dissolve force? But how do you create uh, also some amount of a disaster recovery management institute or some place, mm. you know, in, in Philippines, for example, and and you know, and then really, you know, look at institutionalizing, documenting, processizing, and also getting more of voluntary agencies to come and join as required. And even a lot of young pe other people who want to become volunteers, how do you get them ready to come and, and join this? So I'm just some, and how do you make the investments for doing Jeff? that? I just wanted to think about this. Mm -hmm. so Jeff, I well, think Jeff was signaling to me, so I let him try. What, one of my concerns mm. with this, where the discussion is going at the moment, is it's all dealing with post-event. Mm -hmm. And actually there's a lot, lot more work needed to be done pre-event yep. to mitigate before it happens. You half touched on that when you say, how do we evaluate preparedness? Um, the reality is, it's not easy to do. And we get anecdotal input more than scientific. We're doing work at the moment, um, my own company, with a bunch of academic institutions to start getting a method where we can evaluate how ready individual countries and even segments of countries are to deal with catastrophic flood. And uh, it, it's actually quite a complex process, but we're now able to evaluate, or we've got the tools, we've now got to implement it to evaluate where individual countries are. We've not been able mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. before. And I think uh, that is a critical piece. When you get into the evaluation and so on, and I'd go back the professionals mm -hmm. are the people here on what you do post-event mm -hmm. and how you coordinate it. Mm -hmm. But there's just not nearly enough investment going into the pre-event. Let me give you a good indicator of that. Uh, in one publication that we did called Saving Lives Today and Tomorrow, mm. uh, which really underscores the need for preparedness and resilience. Of all the over, you know, uh, development assistance of the past how many years, only 0.4% of that went to preparedness projects. Yes, same statistic. Uh, when it is so clear that for every dollar spent on preparedness, you save three, four, five, seven, yeah. ten dollars on response. So there is an intellectual Mis gap. gap is that there's a mismatch between the need uh, mm -hmm. for preparedness work and the whole structure of, of, of financing, um, whether it's national governments or the international uh, uh, the donor partnership. Um, and, and I think that's just a, a clear, clear indicator where we're far from our rhetorical commitment to the preparedness work mm. and where we put our money. <laughs> um, uh, but I think you know, all preparedness is, I think it is, is it, you can, ever expected to be complete. For example, in the Sewol Hoferi accident, I was there on my leave in, the, in Korea when that happened, and I can't even begin to describe what a horrific tragedy there was that still lingers. Uh, but you know, it's, clearly there was a very blank spot uh, to Korea's preparedness for these disasters. But I'm just wondering, Ma, you have almost like four you know, experiences. Yolanda's mm -hmm. the worst. Mm -hmm. And I thought his point was perfect. You know, wouldn't there be a depository where Philippines would teach people how to manage an equivalent? <laughs> well, that, that sort of is connected to what I was going to respond when you were asking about how do you make organizations or people resilient. I said, mm. send them over to the Philippines. After a little bit of time, they'll be resilient already. <laughs> <laughs> Especially around December. <laughs> uh, okay. But, but uh, having, having, having said that, I, I think that, I think that the theoretical desired outcome mm. is also must be matched with the reality on the ground. I'll give you an example. We are visited by 20, 25 storms every year, right? except that these storms take a typical path. For Pablo, Sendong, Yolanda, mm. this path was not of that pattern. It looks like the past. Yeah. So notwithstanding alerts, 
uh, the president coming on interrupting uh, uh, national TV during soap opera, you know, when, when it, everybody's watching, interrupting broadcasting and saying, this is serious, this is one of a kind, this is, I mean, never been done in our country's history. On the ground, after the fact, when you ask them, well, why did you not leave? Uh, I don't know what that storm surge is. I, I, we've never, the storm does not come our way, you know? So, and, and that's the reality on the ground. And, 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 or, well, who will guard my meager possessions? I'm, I'm a farmer, I'm a farmer, or I'm a fisherman, uh, uh, subsistence fisherman, doing coastal fishing, and he doesn't want to leave his, whatever, his hut. Yep. You know, maybe the family is, is, is uh, able to leave, but there's always one member of the family that, that stays behind. Or there's really um, an inability to grasp what, you know, miles per hour or kilometers per hour or whatever the the technical description of the storm mm -hmm. may be you know. but but uh, you know people learn by experience mm. and, and and now when when our weather bureau says possibility of surge then you see really people moving and behaving uh, different i mean it's you know we lost uh, more than 6000 people for Yola for Haiyan Yolanda about a million, roughly a million homes were either partially or totally destroyed. Um, it, was just, it was just a humongous uh, effort and, and, and challenge. Imagine no power, no water, no light, no communication, no cell phone, nothing for three, four days before the president could even have a sense of how Okay. how large the devastation was, we had to go through a convoluted army sort of radio over over system mm -hmm. to, to get to Manila to say, this is really of tremendous proportions. Uh, but, but again, having said that, you see a situation where the whole country responds and the international community responds and, and we were able to feed you know, and, and, and to have every day all of these uh, sort of convoys of food going out from all sorts of UN, World Food Organization, everybody from domestic, local, etc. Except that really the devastation was, uh, as, as, as was described by Alan, it, uh, low probability, high, high impact. I mean, mm -hmm. I think this is the world's worst storm. No? So who would have thought that, you know, if it was the usual signal number two, signal number three, you know, it's... No, no, no sweat for us, but this was really of tremendous proportions. Good. Melody? So just a couple comments. I mean, I think that the, um, as far as making a systematic process, or um, I think there's four areas you have to look at. One is prevention. That's all about hardening facilities, building codes, um, practicing evacuations, practicing communications, drilling, and then looking back on those to see did they work or not. Uh, the next one is preparedness. You know, when the storm is coming, are people prepared? Do they have? Uh, I lived in the the Gulf Coast, Gulf of Mexico, my whole life, and um, I was managing our offshore operation during Hurricane Katrina mm. in the Gulf of Mexico. So that I guess is America's Hurricane like Haiyan. Yeah. So very um, um, knowledgeable on those processes. But that prevention process, the preparedness process, the mm. response, and then the business continuity, because being able to have processes in place for all four, and then after uh, a, a, an event occurs, to, to take the time to go back and say what worked well, what didn't, mm -hmm. what were the learnings, how do we incorporate those into this, into our processes, and then go back and drill those learnings mm -hmm. and you know improve those communications or harden those facilities or whatever <coughs> it takes. So I think it's a, it's a process in, an, in a country or in a region of the world where you're prone to that. Mm -hmm exposure, being able to systematically uh, do that, and then share, because I think that there is, the there's, no, there, there's an advantage to share everything you learn in an emergency. But so I others. think there's an issue on sharing, and we need to be very careful with this. It's something that we deal with in businesses, taking something that works in one place and just shifting it elsewhere mm. that doesn't necessarily work. Um, you talk about uh, KRW, Katrina Rita, uh, the, the response to that, and build houses on stilts, do things to mitigate. It doesn't necessarily work the same way in poor territories. So in countries where people are very poor, we do see flood mitigation 
by the authorities saying new buildings have to be built on stilts, they have concrete foundations. Well, what happens? People go and live in the space underneath. underneath. <laughs> and instead of mitigating the situation, we've got people who are even more exposed than they would have been before. Mm. So we have to have the deep insight of how people are going to behave before we start talk, taking solutions mm. on. It can be high, it can go exactly the opposite way of what you want unless you've got that local insight. Good. And I can't take any more questions. I've got signals, but to just finish this round, I'll start with you, Jeff. So for ASEAN, what mm. advice would you give in the state of building resilience in terms of our interconnectedness? Um, you, you asked me for a difficult question. Yeah, you gave me a difficult <laughs> question. Um, I think it's working at every level. I talked about uh, the need to understand who you're dependent on. There is, you've got to deal with micro and macro. The, both of those issues can be very real for the people that are impacted by them. The other thing, uh, I'm trying to reduce it to one. The variation around events is becoming greater than we've seen historically. Mm. And the planning has to start looking at gr greater variation than has historically been the, the case. You can think you're desperately resilient and then you get uh, um, a Japanese uh, tsunami that goes over the level of the protection that was built. Good. Kyo mm -hmm. I think w the point that you made at the end um, about it really, ha it has to be uh, context specific, and ultimately that gets down to communicating with the communities affected. I think that has to be a fundamental element of the response as well as the preparedness, because in the end, this is about people. Right? So, pe I think pe putting people uh, at the at the at the core of of all of these um, endeavors is key. But I, I think I'm in terms of preparedness, I'm. I'm, I'm rather optimistic because everywhere I think there is national capacity strengthening towards preparedness. Mm -hmm. And the Hyogo framework has been uh, instrumental in that regard. Everywhere we go, we see national disaster management authorities with good records of mm -hmm. being prepared and mitigating the, the, the consequences of uh, risks materializing. Uh, so that's good. Uh, there's always room for improvement, and the international community, the UN actors, stand ready to support, uh, whether it's technical assistance and uh, uh, whatnot and training. Um, one indication is what we have this tremendous capacity called the UNDAC network. It's one of the oldest UN uh, response tools that we have. Uh, experts immediately deployable within 24 hours when disaster strikes. Uh, but increasingly, we are, we are getting requests for UNDAC to come and train, train. not to come and assess mm. crisis at, after it happened. Mm. And so I think that's an indication that there's greater emphasis being put on, on preparedness as we also respond to crisis as they happen. Good. And does UNDA train corporate leaders and political leaders? I'm sure if they wish to <laughs> be a part of that, mm. why not? Good. Alan? I mean, the first element is a political will. And uh, I mean, yes. I'm very impressed by also the discussion we have uh, this evening because, I mean, it's very, very open. And uh, I mean, uh, the Filipino authorities are very aware of the need of prevention, preparedness, and all, uh, all this element. And I think there is a keen uh, will to, to, to look at what happened and to improve. For example, now we are in discussion with different authorities uh, to, to see how uh, mortar remains were managed because there were some, some issues, in particular in Tacloban, and we are in discussion with the Ministry of Health, with the National Bureau of Investigation, and they are really looking at uh, adopting some best practices which are uh, really adapted to, to, to local conditions. Then I would say uh, strengthen the legal framework. We know that, I mean, in the Philippines, they're also working on it. Uh, but uh, it means also adopting some, some national laws or regulation on different, different issues, promoting the law, uh, education. Uh, and when I say promoting the law, I uh, also in mind international humanitarian law. And then it's also implementing uh, and ensuring the, the respect of the, of the law. And then I would say look also at the needs of the less uh, favorized 
populations because it's clear that uh, a concern we have uh, after all these uh, uh, mega disasters is that there will be people remaining behind and this I think is really important to to look at and promoting cooperation I think this is a key element we see now that uh, the civil society the business uh, and uh, other actors are very uh, involved and it's really to see how uh, everybody can can cooperate and and do the do the best and my final word maybe would be also to look at strengthening regional <coughs> system as uh, uh, ASEAN um, humanitarian uh, committee, uh, 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 committee for humanitarian assistance that uh, I think should also be, be strengthened based Good. on the experiences. Thank you. Melody, so last word for our corporate leaders here. Okay, so just a few summary comments around decision making uh, with uncertainty and I think it's just really important for countries, companies, communities to have very clear processes around understanding risks, assessing risk, mitigating risk, dealing with uncertainty, um, teaching people how to manage that uncertainty is very important. So very clear processes around that that are clear, well, well understood, um, you know, within a company it's important to have that we deal with a lot of risks. But in um, the focus ought to be on prevention always. Mm -hmm. uh, putting safeguards in place to mitigate risks is extremely important and when those safeguards are in place it's really important to spend time teaching people how to validate and verify that they're in place and working because you know we can we can write it on paper we can put it in a process but you you have to go out into the community or into your operation and validate and verify that it's actually there and it actually is working so that prevention is important and uh, failing, you know, w w the focus on prevention is important, but also being prepared or having processes for preparedness, emergency response, and business continuity. And I can't focus enough on the fact that, you know, when you're in a disaster-prone area, you, you plan, it's not, it's not if it's, or, you know, it's not if it will happen, it's when, just as you said. So you have to get people in the mindset of when this happens, what will what I do? do? You know, so it's after the event as well. You can prepare, pre plan and prepare, mitigate, but what do I do in, uh, after to make sure that my family and my community is safe and, and my business can resume? Good. Ma, you have the last word. We started with you, you have the last word. You've got thank the you. most experience. Thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. I want to make three points. Uh, first, uh, relative to uh, learning and best practice and uh, building up resiliency, well, we take on the offers that were made directly or indirectly uh, by the international community. I think that we really need a distanced view, um, not from in-country, because that will be very much colored by, mm -hmm. by where you sit or what rep organization you represent, but so really from a, from a distanced view, a, a sort of uh, an after-action sort of study or report mm. as to how we could have done better and mm. what other lessons could be learned now. If that is to be shared, then we'd be happy to, to do that. And that's, that's the first point I want to make. Second point is speaking of uh, resiliency, I'd like to, um, as, as mentioned by Mr. Riddle, it's really just building a resilient team. You know? And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce other fellow resilient people, but disruptors as well. Mm. Um, in, our, in our community, we have here the deputy speaker of our House of Representatives, Dina Abad. We have here the uh, President's uh, spokesperson, uh, mm. Secretary Lacierda, and then mm. the Secretary of Budget and Management, Pucha, Pucha Abad. So, I mean, it's, it's really a team effort, everybody working together. We had, we had them packing uh, food uh, packets and arranging for transport and so on and so forth all across this, uh, not just for Hayan or Yolanda, but for all the other uh, calamities uh, that, that we've had. And so it's really building that team and, and, ha and having the leadership uh, of the president as, as, we, were, as, we, were, uh, as, as we had at that time. And then the last point that I want to make is, again, just to uh, thank you for coming to my country. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we welcome you and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the stay. Um, uh, we're, we're very glad. We, we've always been an open people. Uh, and, and we're very glad to host you, to learn from you, and uh, to have you as our friends and fellow partners in developing our country. Thank you very much for that. Great. And on that note, thank you very much for being part of our conversation today. A good time. Just in time for the cultural story. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. It's very thank good you. to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.